Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Munson Healthcare's COVID-19 press conference. Today is Tuesday, September 28th, 2021. We have a very full agenda today. We have uh, quite a few speakers that uh, we will get to before we open up the Q&A session. Uh, but I'm pleased to let you know that today you'll be hearing from Dr. Christine Nefsi, our Chief Medical Officer from Munson Healthcare, Dr. Christopher Ledke, an infectious disease expert with Munson Healthcare, and Dr. James Robertson, a pediatrician with Kids Creek Children's Clinic. You'll also be hearing from our local health department experts, including Wendy Hershenberger, the health officer for the Grand Traverse County Health Department, Lisa Peacock, the health officer with the Benzie Leelanau District Health Department and Health Department of Northwest Michigan. And also joining us will be Dr. Jennifer Morse, the medical director of District Health Department number 10. My name is Diane Mihalik. I'm the Chief Marketing and Communications Officer for Munson Healthcare, and I will be your host today. As a reminder, just before we get started, if you have a question and you are a reporter uh, on the Zoom call, please submit your questions via the Q&A feature. And if you're watching us live on Facebook or another streaming app, please submit your questions through Facebook. And again, we'll get to as many as we can um, at the end of today's presentations. So first, I'd like to introduce uh, and welcome back Dr. Christine Nefsi, the Chief Medical Officer for Munson Healthcare, to give us an update on the current numbers and the status of COVID-19 in Northern Michigan. Welcome, Dr. Nefsi. Thank you, Diane. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. We're going to start out today just by reviewing um, our positivity rate uh, here in Northern Michigan. I do want to point out something uh, that's a little different uh, with this surge than what we've seen with the previous surges in this pandemic, and that is that our percent positivity rate is higher than the state's. This is the first time that we're seeing that um, as something that we're tracking, but uh, here you can see today we are currently at an 11.7% positivity rate compared to 8.8% for the state. Next slide. Um, just to compare where we were the last time we had our press conference, we had 46 positive cases of uh, COVID patients uh, admitted to our Munson Healthcare hospitals. Today, we're actually at 55 as of this morning. Um, and again, just to point out, this is a little bit different than uh, what we've seen in previous surges where we saw a really linear uptick in cases and then a decline. And we've really been uh, fairly steady in our numbers in the mid 40s to low 50s for a while now. Um, so acting uh, a little bit different than what we've seen in the past, um, not nearly as high, but certainly lasting longer. We think this probably has something to do with the fact uh, that we have so many people immunized, um, but we're not entirely sure why the surge is behaving differently. Um, but we have been maintaining a steady uh, number uh, around in the uh, mid mid 40s to low to medium 50s uh, for over a month now. Next slide. Um, again, uh, one of our concerns on pediatric cases, so the state is reporting, they saw a pretty sharp uptick in the number of pediatric cases of COVID-19 and as a result in pediatric hospitalizations. The numbers are still low compared to adults, um, but um, certainly a concern, especially if we want to learn from what people uh, in the Mountain West and in the South are seeing. Additionally, we are seeing a lot of cases of RSV, uh, which is typically a winter virus that we see in children, and we have started to see some cases of flu. Uh, so there is a little bit of a concern about having all three of those uh, viruses um, happen simultaneously and what that could mean for our pediatric population. Uh, we are seeing an overall percentage increase again in the number of kids uh, 0 to 18 years of age uh, that have COVID. Um, so you can see as an example, um, District Health Department number 10 has increased from a 1.7 positivity rate in that age group in early July to a 14.3% now. Some of that likely has to do with school um, and being back together and the uh, variation in uh, requiring masking. Uh, there have been quite a few articles of late recently showing um, that schools that have a mask mandate are doing much better in their uh, percentage rates uh, of COVID than schools that do not have that mask mandate. Next slide. So again, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the CDC, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services all strongly recommend, recommend masking in school. Um, that masking protects both the children 
uh, the teachers and the families of those children. Um, since this COVID-19, especially the Delta variant, has a very high viral load, it is very transmissible. And so we do just continue to recommend that you follow the data and uh, mask your children to prevent not only the spread of COVID-19, but the spread of influenza, the spread of RSV, all of which we are seeing. This is especially important in indoor settings. Next slide. So here's our vaccine dashboard for our region. So you can see here, um, we have about uh, almost 61% of our population that has completed a vaccine series. Next slide. And uh, we wanna stress also as we're seeing an uptick in our percent positivity, um, uh, uh, the importance of getting tested. So, you know, there are other things going around. So it's really important that we know what's going on. If you have COVID, there's monoclonal antibody therapy, um, and you may be putting uh, people at risk that uh, that might not be the case with other viruses. So uh, in order for you to know what's going on and whether you need to quarantine to protect those around you, we would recommend if you're having any symptoms um, of upper respiratory issues, you know, runny nose, cough, fever, sore throat, um, again, the loss of smell, loss of taste is still uh, one of those, but any symptoms like that, please go get tested. The monoclonal antibody therapy is available for high-risk people if uh, the COVID-19 positive test is within uh, 10 days of symptom onset. And as a reminder, that COVID-19 still has uh, over 2% mortality rate, which is about 20 times more than what we typically see with our seasonal influenza rate. So really important to understand what's going on. Next slide. And then again about testing, um, lots of opportunity to get testing with your local uh, primary care provider, uh, some of our pharmacies, our local health departments. If you need help, you can get on to the www.michigan.gov slash coronavirus to find a testing site based on your zip code. There's a hotline and we also have the Munson Healthcare Ask a Nurse line. I would say uh, this is a, a very busy season um, for us here at Munson Healthcare as it is around the state. So uh, we would not recommend that you show up to an urgent care or an emergency department just to get a test. There are other resources available to you if you are simply looking at testing. Obviously, if you are ill um, and having any symptoms that you think you need to be seen for and treated, please don't hesitate to come to one of our urgent cares or emergency departments. Thanks, Dr. Nafsi. Um, related to what you just said about emergency departments and urgent cares, um, can you reiterate that again? If someone is uh, just thinks they may have COVID-19 or needs to get tested for a various reason, whether it's returning to school or work or something like that, um, where is the best place for them to go? And, and if they do show up at an urgent care or an emergency department, what kind of stress does that put on the healthcare system um, and how that relates to patients who really do have life-threatening illnesses or do actually need medical treatment. Right. Well, you know, as stated here uh, in our Munson Healthcare region, as well as across the state, um, we are seeing a lot of issues with staffing and uh, very, very busy emergency departments and urgent cares, um, you know, with, with illness. And so uh, we really want to reserve those settings for people that need to be seen in either an urgent or emergent way. Um, when those urgent cares and emergency departments are filled with people waiting just for testing who don't really need to be seen or treated, otherwise they're not having symptoms or their symptoms are very mild, that obviously delays uh, the care that we can provide for people who need it more urgently. So our recommendation would be to um, assess any of those resources we see listed here, um, whether that's through the health department or through your primary care department or through um, one of the private pharmacies. Um, please look to that as a resource to provide testing before you come to an urgent care or an emergency room. We really want to reserve those settings um, for people who um, need an intervention from a healthcare professional uh, in, the, uh, in an immediate way. And Dr. Nefsi, what would be some of the signs or symptoms um, if you think you have COVID-19 for when you really should um, seek emergency or, or urgent care? Well, certainly if you are short of breath. So if you're having any kind of difficulty breathing, we would want you to be seen immediately. If you have a high fever, 
um, if you just are so weak you can't um, adequately eat or drink to keep your energy up. Those are kinds of the things that we would uh, want you to come into the emergency room for. If you have a lot of other comorbidities that make you at high risk and you are uh, having symptoms that are impacting your ability to go to work, attend school, uh, do your daily you know, activities of living, those are all reasons we'd want you to come in to be seen. Otherwise, if you're having relatively mild symptoms, a little bit of cough and cold, sniffles, that kind of thing, um, please seek testing uh, at, from another resource. Thanks, Dr. Nessie. And just a reminder, and you can see on the bottom of this slide that um, if you're not sure, um, if you have a question, the Munson Healthcare Ask a Nurse line is a great resource um, to help direct you to the right level of care. And again, we're just trying to make sure that all of our resources, our limited resources here in Northern Michigan are, are being used to their, um, you know, their best and most efficient um, capacity and that we're able to care for um, all the patients um, who need it. So thanks, Dr. Nefsi. Um, we will have you back uh, for the Q&A session uh, after the other presenters um, have finished their presentations. That's good, thank you. So next, it's my pleasure to welcome back Dr. Christopher Ledke, an infectious disease physician with Munson Healthcare. Dr. Ledke, it's great to see you again. Um, lots has changed since we last spoke. So um, can you give us um, an update on what you're currently seeing? Sure, thanks, Diane. Thanks for having me again. Uh, I wanted to clarify a specific aspect of the vaccination that we've been hearing a lot about, which is the booster. And there's been a lot in the news about this and it's changing rapidly. So um, I think there's some confusion and I wanted to make some clarifications. So by booster, we mean a third dose of vaccine that is six months or more out from your initial two dose series. And this so far is really only approved for those who receive the Pfizer vaccine as their initial series. So if you receive the Johnson & Johnson or the Moderna vaccine as your initial uh, formulation, then this does not apply to you. Although those formulations are being evaluated for boosting and will likely be approved in the next month or so. But as of now, when we say booster, we're talking about um, Pfizer, and again, six months or more out from the initial series. This is different than the three-dose series that has been approved and recommended for those uh, who are immunocompromised as their initial vaccination. So one of the points of confusion, I think, is that there's a stepwise manner for uh, uh, an additional therapy like this to be approved, and it includes uh, different advisory panels as well as approval through the FDA. So the third dose Pfizer booster has had an emergency use authorization passed within the past week from the FDA. And so it then goes to the CDC through their advisory panel, which is the American College of Immunization Practices or ACIP. And so here's where another point of confusion comes in, in that there was actually discrepancies in who should uh, or would be a candidate to get this booster between some of these advisory panels and the CDC. So it's quite clear that those who have immunocompromising conditions or major comorbidities should clearly receive this. Um, the question is whether younger, healthy uh, patients or, or um, part of that population uh, should get this booster based on risk factors or exposure at work. And the big question is healthcare workers. Should healthcare workers get this? So actually the advisory panel for the CDC um, only recommended those who are elderly or immunocompromised. And then it went to the CDC and they had a vote which was not unanimous. And they actually voted against uh, recommending it for healthcare workers. And the way that the CDC um, uh, kind of outline this is they have a population who they clearly recommend should have the booster, and that is those who are 65 and over, those who are in a long-term care setting regardless of age, and then those who are uh, 50 or over who have an underlying medical condition and they have a large list of comorbidities including cancer, chronic lung disease, chronic kidney disease, immunocompromising conditions, uh, stroke, dementia, you can see that on the CDC website. 
And then they break it down into those who may have the uh, booster. And that includes those who are younger, so less than 50 with those uh, chronic medical conditions I just mentioned. And again, you can read those on their website or those who have high risk exposure because of occupational or institutional settings. So they um, are putting this in a category of those who may get the vaccine. So um, part of the issue is that the, um, the data to, uh, uh, to support efficacy in the elderly population is quite clear. And in the younger population, there are smaller studies that clearly suggest a robust immune response, but real world data is lacking. There are really no safety concerns here. It's more, is it worth doing? Is it, uh, is it gonna be effective? So that's really where the discrepancy is. But as of now, um, there are uh, populations where the CDC clearly suggests that you should get it and populations who the CDC says that you may consider it. And again, it, it, it typically has this little caveat that you should discuss with your primary care doc. So um, I hope that clears it up. If you have further questions, I would uh, point you to their um, uh, website on the CDC, which has a special section for um, the booster vaccine. Thanks, Dr. Ledke. So if somebody has a question about this, is the best thing to do to discuss with their primary care provider? Yes, exactly, exactly. Okay. And I think the, it, ultimately probably the threshold will be low to recommend these because we have plenty of supply. And if you meet criteria based on um, the outline, the, that outline by the CDC, there's really um, uh, not a good reason not to get it, but, um, but there are discrepancies and little nuances to, to who benefits most from it. And is there any uh, data or recommendations to suggest um, if you were vaccinated very early when vaccines first uh, became available, should um, should you you know be thinking about getting a booster versus if you were vaccinated um, in July of this year? Is there any difference? Sure. So there's certainly a correlation with how long ago. Um, not just your vaccination, but if you have had COVID in the past as well, okay. that protection wanes over time. And that is variable based on, first of all, how severe your disease was uh, mm -hmm. in the case of a natural infection, uh, the uh, age of the patient, the immuno uh, immunocompromising conditions, comorbidities, things like that. So the longer out that you have had your vaccine, the more likely you are to benefit from a booster. Great, thank you. And again, speak to your primary care provider uh, to discuss your personal medical history. And if you don't have a primary care provider, you have some questions, um, that Munson Healthcare Ask a Nurse line is available. So thanks, Dr. Ledke. Anything else um, you'd like to mention before we move on to our next speaker? Nope, I think we got a full schedule, so. Okay, great, thanks. We'll have on. you back um, later to join the Q&A panel. So next, it is uh, my pleasure to welcome for the first time, uh, Dr. Jim Robertson. He's a pediatrician with Kids Creek Children's Clinic. Uh, and uh, Dr. Robertson, um, we're so happy to have you join us today because I know there's a lot of parents out there that have a lot of questions um, about kids getting back to school and um, flu season right around the corner and what we're hearing about RSV. So first, um, just wanna welcome you. And uh, let just give us a sense of what you're currently seeing in your practice um, as school has uh, gotten back into session. It, we, we had about a year and a half where we were seeing very little in the way of respiratory illness, probably because of everybody staying home and because of masking. And But as soon as school started this year, it came back kind of with a vengeance. And our, our numbers are higher the last three weeks than they've been in eight years in terms of seeing kids for respiratory illness. And I checked with the other practices in town too, and it, it's a similar thing where they are. We're just a lot of upper respiratory tract infections, which then leaves people in kind of a tough situation. Um, I would say the majority of what we're seeing are just regular colds, sinus infections, runny noses. Um, but you know, in the back of your mind, it's, hey, COVID causes the same symptoms. When do I get tested and not? And that may be why we're seeing so many people in the office, but, um, we're seeing a lot of positive RSV tests, um, especially in the younger population. I checked in with, with the ER 
um, last night, knowing we were going to be talking today, and mm -hmm. um, the hospitalists, the pediatric hospitalists, feel like they're seeing about one to two cases of RSV a, a day that needs um, either inpatient care or transfer. Um, well, and for those of us um, who may not be familiar with RSV or, or people who are new to this uh, discussion, can you explain what RSV is and when or how often you would typically see this versus what you're seeing now? I mean, RSV is a, it's a respiratory virus similar to the flu um, and a lot of like coronavirus um, colds, but um, it tends to be seasonal. It tends to start in the fall and go through um, the winter and kind of fizzle out in the spring. This year we're seeing it way earlier than we ever have. Um, it's essentially for an adult is, is like a regular cold and you wouldn't really know the difference, but the RSV stands for respiratory syncytial virus and the syncytial essentially means the, the respiratory cells that get infected when they fall off, they're very sticky and okay. they form globules. And so the snot tends to be very thick and stringy and in infants or younger kids that don't have a good forceful cough, those little sticky globules can block airways and cause oxygen levels to drop, cause respiratory distress. Um, so it's a much more significant illness, the smaller the airway. So obviously the smaller the patient. Um, so for, for preschool, kindergarten kids, um, it's not gonna seem a whole lot different than a regular cold, but when there's infants in the house and that gets brought home, it can be a much more significant and serious illness. Um, and we're just seeing numbers earlier than we ever have and, and, and a lot of it in the community right now. There hasn't been um, very much flu at all in, in the younger population. In fact, I couldn't find anybody in the ER um, or the other practices that have seen a positive flu yet, um, which doesn't mean it's not here. We just haven't seen a lot of it. Um, and then we're doing a lot of testing, especially as school got back in and and we are seeing positive COVID cases, but um, not at a super high rate. Um, okay. Two or three a week in the office. Is there any rhyme or reason to why you think you're seeing more RSV cases this year as opposed to previous years and possibly earlier in the season? I'm not sure there's any consensus on that yet, except that we basically skipped last RSV season because People stayed home, people mass, and it was similar to flu. There was virtually no flu last year. And now we're seeing a lot more large gatherings, a lot more people out and about. There are lots of schools that aren't masking. Um, and I, I mean, I will add that anecdotally too. Like there are schools in the area that are masking and there are schools that aren't. And we definitely in the office are seeing more illness from the, the schools that aren't masking in terms of just numbers and percentages of patients. Um, but I think that's the big theory with RSV is that we just, we had a whole year without it. And now as we start to get back together, it's kind of been waiting in the wings. And um, and then there's some concern that COVID makes it easier for RSV to spread and, and actually cause more significant illness if you have two respiratory viruses simultaneously. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And then related to the flu, I um, believe we had a, a relatively light flu season last year. So if RSV was light last year and now we're seeing more of it, do you expect this year's flu season in children to be of more concern? I, I think that's the consensus. It's kind of waiting to see how it plays out, but um, I think everybody's worried that flu is, one, there's probably a little less natural immunity because we skipped the whole season. Okay. Um, and two, um, it's been a while. So sure. we're encouraging, we have the flu, I think all the pediatric offices and, and a lot of other offices have, have the flu vaccine in now and we're encouraging people to do that early because um, we know that, that that works as well. And and Dr. Robertson, you know, children, especially young children sometimes have difficulty describing their symptoms, what they're feeling, um, telling their parents, you know, what's going on with their bodies. How can parents determine if a visit to a doctor is necessary? What should they be looking for? And I think Dr. Nessie said it earlier, I, I, you know, any kind of breathing difficulty is the big thing. And we do a lot of that. And that's been an issue for our office always, right? Trying to screen people over the phone and figure out who needs to come in. But I, I think if you feel like a child's got any difficulty breathing, which can be increased rate, increased work, 
Um, a lot of times in littler ones, it's struggling to feed because it's hard to eat while you're breathing. And so okay. they make the right choice and they breathe instead of eat. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think respiratory difficulty is the big thing. And then I, you know, lethargy, lack of energy. Um, a lot of times we have people look at their kid's chest and if you can see the rib cage jumping out at you with each breath, that tends to be a sign there's too much work going into the breathing. Okay, great. Well, that's good advice um, for parents. And um, again, it sounds like if, uh, if you're a parent out there and, and you're concerned about any symptoms your child may have, um, you can either call your pediatrician's office to try to determine if it's best to come in. Um, I believe you can also call the, the Munson Healthcare Ask a Nurse line um, if you need help finding resources or, or have some general questions. But um, Dr. Robertson, any, other, any additional comments you'd want to make uh, before we move on to our health department experts? Um, I'm not sure. Any, I, mean, I guess I, I would say I think we're seeing mask, masking work. Um, and some of that's anecdotal and some of that we have, you know, good data too, but I, we are really seeing some of the schools that are pretty stringent with their masking have, have less issue to this point in the school year. Um, and it's a simple thing to do. And, and really, if you want to follow the science, there's two things that can make a big difference this time of year. One is vaccination and two is masking. Um, there's a lot of a, opinion out there, but, um, if you want to follow the science, those two things are pretty well vetted. Um, so, and, and again, anecdotally, but in our office, most kids don't have any trouble wearing the mask. And I think given that option, it, it's better to do that than not. Great. Thank you, Dr. Robertson. We really appreciate you being here today, seeing how busy um, it sounds like you are. Um, we will. Uh, we would like you to stick around and join us um, at the end of today's presentations for the Q&A session. So thanks again, um, and we'll have you back shortly. So next, um, I would like to welcome back uh, Wendy Hershenberger from the Grand Traverse County Health Department. As a reminder, Wendy does not have the video capabilities, so um, we'll be hearing her voice today. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you. Good morning. So I just thought I'd start with some numbers for Grand Traverse County. Dr. Nesty did a great job going over the regional numbers, um, but for just Grand Traverse County alone, uh, we're definitely seeing an increase, and we've seen a, a steady increase since July, but I'm just showing a kind of progression of some numbers from August to September. So you can see our average uh, daily cases has gone up about one and a half, 1.5 times, so 150%. Um, our active cases, that's cases that are have been diagnosed uh, within the last 30 days, so we've uh, more than doubled that. Uh, and as far as kind of where we're at, um, we're similar to where we were, say, back in early April of last year, which is our worst month. So we ended up kind of peaking, averaging about 55 cases a day. So we're, we're still continuing to see that increase in trend and, and hoping not to get to that high, but we will, we will see. Um, our average uh, school age cases per day has gone from one to four a day. So it's 10% of our daily caseload to about 15% of our caseload. Um, our active school cases have tripled within the last month. And we have seen um, deaths the last two months where we had had quite a gap um, from deaths previously. So we've seen those numbers go up as well. Our percent positivity for Grand Travers County alone has averaged between eight and nine percent, eight and 10% for the last month. So we're seeing those numbers. Um, we in our county are tracking the, the state average pretty similarly, um, but our region is higher than that as a whole. So that's where we're at for numbers. Uh, for vaccinations, our overall vaccination rate is uh, for a first dose, we're at 72.6% uh, for Grand Traverse County. And for completion, we're at 68.7. But this is just a breakdown by uh, the age groups. And you can see essentially in the, the less than uh, 50 year age group, we have um, some more um, opportunity for vaccination there. So uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see information about our vaccination uh, clinics. So we're still vaccinating at the Cherryland site as our primary uh, COVID-19 only vaccination. Um, this week due to 
the, the booster demands, the demands from people for the booster shot, we are only offering the Pfizer vaccine at that location. Now we can give a first, second, third dose or the booster. So any, any combination thereof, um, but it is the Pfizer vaccine only uh, this week. And that's just because we're um, trying to run a higher number of people through just because the demand is so great right now. Um, our clinic schedule there this week is Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, we are partnering with HANU um, and the health department. So certain days are gonna be staffed by health department staff, others um, by, a, it's a state staffing resource that helps out local health departments right now. You can go to our website for the most um, up-to-date uh, um, options and appointments are required. Uh, we can't do walk-ins because of that, but we do really ask that if you make an appointment that if you plan to not show that you cancel the appointment. So that opens the slot for someone else. Um, because of that, we're doing rolling scheduling. So we, we put out the appointments just about 24 hours in advance. Uh, if we do it much sooner than that, then we tend to get a lot of no-shows. Um, so that's why we're, we're doing it that way because there are options in the community for vaccination that, that are you know, beyond just our clinic. So that's why we're, we're scheduling that way. Next slide, please. And then we're still also doing testing, um, just to note that this is diagnostic testing. Again, this is for anyone who has symptoms, anybody who's had an exposure, um, particularly like kids maybe who are quarantined and need to get tested after an exposure to go back into school. So uh, we are no longer offering travel testing. There are several other options in the area for the travel testing. Um, again, because it's diagnostic testing, it's, it's the appointments are released typically within 24 to 48 hours in advance, because um, that's usually when people know that they need to get tested. And we do need to get people tested so we can get them isolated. Um, and these are, um, we're offering this week, Tuesday and Thursday from 9 a.m. to 12 and 1 to 4. Uh, we hope to be able to increase the number of testing, but again, this is just based on our, our staff ability and with doing five days a week vaccination right now, um, this is what we're able to offer. And you do get those results delivered electronically uh, within two hours and then the PCR test can take up to 72 hours um, for the final results. That's all I have today, thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Appreciate uh, your continued uh, efforts to keep us updated, and uh, we'll have you back for the Q&A session. Uh, next, I would like to welcome back Lisa Peacock, uh, the Health uh, Officer with the Benzie Leelanau District Health Department and the Health Department of Northwest Michigan. Welcome back, Lisa. Thanks, Diane. Happy to be here. Um, so I will, I think I have a slide on next. I think I just have one slide. And I'll, and I'll just talk about it if you're- Yeah, we'll get, th we'll get there. There it goes, I think. No problem. <laughs> Slight delay. <laughs> no problem. So, um, you know, very similar to what others have described, we continue to see the pandemic risk, all elements of pandemic risk trending upward at the local, state, regional, and national level. Um, I've listed some information about our, our cases at my two health departments here. You know, on average, the daily cases being reported to the health departments are in the Northwest District at 41 cases per day and the Benzie Leelanau District at 12 cases per day. And, you know, just a little context for that. In mid July, um, we were at the lowest point that we've been at throughout the pandemic with average daily cases being reported. And we were less than one at Benzie Leelanau, just a little over one case per day at Northwest. So it has gone up significantly. We have not reached the same peak. Um, at either department that we were um, at during the spring, during mid-April, when we saw our highest peak of 84 average daily cases at Northwest and um, 20 or so average daily cases at Benzie Leelanau. But you can see we are tracking in that direction and it's certainly been going up pretty steadily since the beginning of August. Um, the other thing I wanted to note is that um, I have a, given you a percentage of the breakdown of age groups um, for our cases at both departments. And just wanna point out that almost a third of our new cases that have been reported so far in September 
um, to Health Department in Northwest Michigan have been under age 20, and nearly 20% of the cases in the Benzie Lelana jurisdiction reported since the beginning of September have been under age 20. So certainly, um, you know, aligns with what Dr. Nefsi and, and everyone else has, has said today that we need to, you know, stay on top of this. The pandemic is still trending upward and there's still risk out there. Um, we are noting that testing demand is also way up in our areas as well. We are um, working with state resources to bring in additional um, testing opportunities for people in all of our communities when we're trying to strategically place those sites at alternative times, such as on weekends, um, and very simple drive-through testing uh, with rapid results available. And um, I would just direct everyone to both of our websites. That's where you can find information about testing. That's where you can find information about how to make an appointment for um, a vaccination and anything else that um, our daily updates and all the other information that we offer. You can also call 211. They're very helpful with helping people get scheduled for appointments and finding health department resources. Um, and then I also will just mention that um, our vaccination rates continue to, to inch up. Um, certainly we've seen the same um, slowdown in, in first doses being given that everyone has seen. Um, but at this point, we're at 67.1% of our residents in the Northwest District, 16 and over with the first dose, and a little over 75% of Benzie Lelana residents with the first dose. Um, we have over half of our 12 to 15 year olds in Benzie Lelana vaccinated with the first dose, which is really great, um, and nearly 40% in the Northwest District. We still want to see that age group continue to get protected. And in the meantime, we encourage um, ongoing protective measures like masking, um, testing right away if you have symptoms, being compliant with isolation and quarantine, um, and really answering the health department's calls. We're still working really hard to make sure that we can contain transmission by identifying um, new cases early, getting their contacts identified and, and all the instructions that they need to have, but we can't do any of that um, if someone doesn't call us back. So answer those surveys, um, return those phone calls, and let's all work together to keep everyone safe. Thanks, Lisa. Appreciate that update um, and appreciate everything you're doing to also help with the, the testing resources. As Dr. Nefsi and I just mentioned that our emergency departments and urgent cares are, are quite full with um, that demand as well. Um, so our last speaker today, uh, I'd like to welcome back Dr. Jennifer Morse, who's the medical director of district health department number 10. Welcome back, Dr. Morse. Looking forward to your update. Thanks. Um, just like everyone else has mentioned, we've seen significant increases in our case counts. Um, we're also seeing increase in our uh, pediatric and school age cases. Um, as an example, the week we have, I have week long data for our 10 counties. Um, the week ending August 21st, our whole district saw 258 cases. 34 of those were in those that were 5 to 18. This past week ending the 25th, we had 828 total cases and 224 of those were in school age kids or those that were five to 18. So about a third of them were in that age group. So we continue to see some significant increases in that age group. Um, we continue to offer vaccines. We're offering third doses and boosters. Um, at this time, we're, we're offering them in the same um, way as we have been. We do have walk-ins. Um, we encourage you to check ahead though, just to make sure we do have a nurse available. You can schedule a vaccine through our scheduling line. And also you can go to our website to find where we may have pop-up clinics. And also when our vaccine uh, clinics are available at our 10 different offices. Um, I believe that's all we have right now to report, but any questions I'm happy to answer. Great. Thanks, Dr. Morris. Yep. Um, I'm going to ask uh, all of our panelists to come back on for and turn their cameras back on for our Q&A session. We do have quite a few questions uh, coming in already, and we'll get to as many as we can um, in the amount of time we wanted to have enough time to get to all of our speakers today. So we'll get right into it. Um, the first question is for uh, Dr. Ledke. Uh, the question is, we've seen two springs and two summers with COVID now, and we're heading into fall and winter number two with coronavirus. Have we been able to get a sense of seasonal patterns for COVID risk moving forward? And do we anticipate a COVID season like we have a flu season? No, 
there's no evidence to suggest this is seasonal at all. It, it's surge based. So you have local surges um, in specific parts of the country in different parts of the world on the north side of the equator, south side of the equator, um, completely unrelated to what season is happening. So I would not think of this as a seasonal virus in any capacity. It is um, based on local surges likely related to new variants being introduced into the area. Interesting, thanks Dr. Leckie. Uh, one more question for you. Are we seeing uh, breakthrough cases on the rise? And if, if yes, do we know how many? Oh, we certainly are seeing breakthrough cases, and that likely has to do with the um, Delta variant's ability to evade protection from the um, vaccination. How many we've seen, I don't have that d data to report. Um, they, they do tend to be milder. Um, obviously, the risk of hospitalization and death is lower. We are still seeing some hospitalized patients with who are fully vaccinated. That's inevitable. But um, we do know that, again, the protection is quite high. And in regards to how many, um, I, I don't have that information available. OK, thanks, Dr. Leike. Uh, next question is for uh, Dr. Nefsi. Um, related to months in healthcare, are any elective surgeries uh, still being scheduled? Um, a lot of elective surgeries are still being scheduled. Uh, we have had, because of staffing issues on a case-by-case, day-by-day basis, had some surgeries be postponed. Um, but again, that's not a uh, standard practice and it's being done um, just day-to-day, -day. Uh, but we still are doing uh, just about everything um, on a day-to-day -day basis. It's amazing giving this uh, recent surge. Um, Dr. Nefsi, another question about uh, the and maybe Dr. Ledke can also uh, join in on this. When we talk about boosters or third doses earlier in the pandemic, uh, it was stated that you should not receive one, um, the COVID-19 vaccine within a certain amount of time after receiving another vaccination. Is that still the case? That is not the case. Um, so that was an initial recommendation was to wait two weeks between getting the COVID vaccine and any other vaccine. Uh, what we know now is you can safely co administer Did anyone else freeze up? Minister, okay. Really safe as an example oh. to get your COVID booster and a flu vaccine at the same time. Okay, great. So it sounds like we can get them all at the same time then. Great. Um, and uh, Dr. Ledke, you did you were talking a lot about boosters and uh, third doses. Is that only for Pfizer right now? Yes, it's only for Pfizer, and okay. it's, again, only for those who've received an initial two-dose Pfizer series. So I, I think I saw one question on there regarding those who received the initial three-dose Pfizer series because of immunocompromised status. That isn't known yet, whether those would be... Oh, it's like we we're having some... Like a month or more ago. And for those who've not received, yeah, sorry, it says my internet connection is is unstable. That's okay. That's okay. We'll get back to you. Thanks, Dr. Leckie. Um, another question yep. uh, for Dr. Robertson. Um, when do we expect that the uh, vaccines will be available for children um, younger than 12? And from what and that might be a good question for Lisa or Wendy as well, but from what we're hearing, potentially within the next month, and okay. I think all of the pediatric offices are planning on giving those vaccines in their office to help the health department out. Great, thanks, Dr. Robertson. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Lisa Peacock uh, this next question. It's for um, our health departments. Um, for our health department professionals. When contact, contact trace calling, what determines who, who should really quarantine and who, should, who doesn't need to quarantine? 
All of that is determined um, through the process of case investigation. So okay. when we're notified of a positive case, we contact that person and we conduct an interview, um, which asks all of those questions and helps us identify who they've been in close contact with, with you know, and then we go from there determining um, quarantine instructions for them. Great, thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Next question is for, um, I'm gonna ask this of Dr. Nefsi, but I'd like um, anyone else to, to weigh in on this. We talked a lot about testing resources in our communities and that, do we have enough testing in our in Northern Michigan right now? You know, we have enough tests right now. What we're running into is really the staff to administer the tests is the issue. Um, so, you know, we're even without the pandemic, we're in a very, very busy um, season. And uh, you can you combine that with uh, some staffing problems um, and then the demand for testing and it's sort of the perfect storm. So it's less about testing resources and more about staffing. Thanks, Dr. Nafsi. And um, one last question, if Dr. Ledke, if you, I'm not sure if your internet connection has gotten any better, um, but do you anticipate a fourth dose after a third dose for immunocompromised individuals? Or, or just do we not know enough about it yet? Oh, shoot. He's, I think he froze up. <laughs> I think all that hair gets in the way uh, of the I'm back. connection. I know. I'm back. Sorry. Did you hear that? What was that, Diane? Um, do you anticipate a fourth dose for immunocompromised? Uh, not at this time. That isn't known yet. It's still the booster is specifically a third dose. So that would be a um, third dose for those who initially received the, the the first two dose series of Pfizer. So that may be known down the road, but this is this is really only for those who have received the two dose. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Nefsi, I'm going to try to get to two more questions really quickly because I know we're, we're out of time and I want to be conscious of our, our speaker's time today. Um, but I think these are two pretty important questions. Um, the first one is, um, is Munson Healthcare using ivermectin to treat COVID-19? I think we've heard a lot about this on the news as a horse or a livestock dewormer. Yeah, we are not using ivermectin to treat COVID positive patients because there's no clinical indication to use that. We will still use it topically um, when appropriate for people who have scabies or if you have a parasitic infection, uh, but there's no indication to use ivermectin for COVID at this point. Okay, and one last question uh, for Dr. Nefsi. Um, have wait times increased in the emergency rooms because of COVID-19? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's hard to say it's directly impacted by COVID-19. It's probably a combination of the demand for people who have COVID-19 and are symptomatic, people who are coming to the emergency room for testing um, and an already busy season and being short staffed. It's all of those things combined. So I think um, the bottom line is we just ask people to, to be very patient. We're trying to get inf as much information out as we can about the process when you do have to go to an emergency room or an urgent care and just um, being patient as, as we work through the process. And, and also just keep in mind that as um, with our emergency departments, we have to prioritize those trauma cases um, that are coming in as well. So that, that you may not always see as you're sitting in a waiting room, those trauma cases are coming in um, through, through other doors. Um, in our facilities. So please, um, please be patient and um, please call the Munson Healthcare Ask a Nurse Line if you have any questions about what, where to seek care um, and what's the appropriate level of care for you. And that number is 231-935-0951. So sorry, we went a little bit over time today, but I just wanna thank um, all of our, our speakers today, Dr. Nefsi, Dr. Ledke, Dr. Robertson, uh, Wendy Hershenberger, Lisa Peacock, and, and Dr. Jennifer Morse. Um, we truly appreciate all the valuable information you've shared uh, with us. And um, next slide, please, just as a reminder, um, we're doing these press conferences as often as we can when we can get our experts together and when we have new information to share. Hopefully we'll have another one of these in about two weeks. In the meantime, we encourage you to sign up for our e-newsletter follow us on social media or visit MunsonHealthcare.org for the latest information. So thanks everyone. Have a great day and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.